Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with, if I could choose only one work by composer X, it would have to be work Sigma. Well, you can guess by the Sigma who the composer might be. Well, maybe not. Okay, it's Karl Orff, who would like to write in like Latin and Greek. So why not Sigma, huh? Well, you also know probably what work we're choosing. Well, maybe not entirely. I'm hedging a little bit in this particular case because work Sigma is Triumphi, the whole trilogy. It's really a single work. I mean, he wrote it between like 1937 and 1951, somewhere in there. And Triumphi consists of three works, three cantatas, all grouped together. Um, they are Carmina Burana, which requires no introduction, Catulli Carmina, the second in the trilogy, and Triumpho di Aphrodite, the triumph of Aphrodite. Now, why did I pick Triumphi instead of just the obvious Carmina Burana? Well, the reason is, is really quite simple. The concept here is to display that which is most typical of the composer. And in Orff's case, we have a very strange situation because what is most typical of the composer is that as he progressed, if you want to call it that, his music gradually dried up or became less interesting. It became more obsessed with, with rhythmic declamation and sort of just percussive noise things. And you can hear that actually in Triumphi in certain respects. Um, each in a slightly different way in its different phases. The most orchestrally and instrumentally bountiful piece he wrote was, in fact, Carmina Burana. It's sung all the way through. It has great tunes. It deserves its sort of ridiculous popularity. I really think it does. It's, 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 it's a masterpiece based entirely um, on the, the ethos of Stravinsky's Les Nos, The Wedding. I mean, you might say that Stravinsky wrote Les Nos and then Karl Orff kept writing it for the rest of his life in various ways. I mean, it's not the most original piece in the world, but it's a very effective one. And so, I mean, I love Carmina Burana. I've sung it. I've played it. I, you know, it's, it's tremendous fun. Really a, a brilliant piece of music. It had a sequel. And I remember the shock I felt on learning that it had a sequel. In fact, that it had two sequels. And of course, I rushed out to get the sequel. And I put it on and I was like, oh, okay. Why? Because Catulli Carmina, I mean, all three things are about love in a way. You know, the Carmina Burana is the songs of the Burons, you know, vagabond monks and wandering scholars in the disgusting Middle Ages when no one bathed and they had no toilet paper and everyone stank. And they sang about the, 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 the virtues and sufferings of love. Okay, so that was Carmina Burana. Catulli Carmina is a setting of poems by the Latin poet Catullus about his relationship with a woman um, who he calls Lesbia. Um, that wasn't her actual name. It was like Clotilde or something. I don't know. She, she had another name. Anyway, um, they didn't get along. The relationship tanked because she cheated on him. And it tells that story. And it tells that story framed by a Latin prologue written by Orff himself, in which young women and men are, are taunting each other in quasi-pornographic terms. Um, and a bunch of old men are saying, eh, all those young people are all just, you know, eh, yeah. And, and so he does that. Now, Catulli Carmina has three big parts with a prologue and an epilogue, and it's written entirely for a cappella chorus. That is no accompaniment whatsoever, except for the prologue and the epilogue, which are scored for the same forces as Stravinsky's Les Nos, that is for pianos and percussion. And, and rather irritatingly so. I mean, it's, you know, esayona, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. It's, it's, it's kind of annoying. Not as much fun as Carmina Burana, full of repetition, the actual a cappella stuff where they tell the story is very beautiful. Some of the choral writing is, is absolutely exquisite. It's lovely, but it ain't Carmina Burana. Let's not kid ourselves, right? So that's that. Then we get to Il Triumpho di Aphrodite, the triumph of Aphrodite, and that is Stravinsky's Les Nos. It's a wedding. 
It's a celebration of a pagan wedding. I mean, just like Leno says, right? In this case, it's a Greek wedding. And the text is partly in Latin and partly in Greek and partly again from the poetry of Catullus and partly from other places that Orff cobbled it together. It has even less interesting music than the previous two numbers. I mean, Catulli Carmen, it gets performed once in a while. Triumpho, almost never, almost never. And it's, it has some pretty moments. At the end, Aphrodite actually shows up. There's a vision of Aphrodite. And there's this sort of orgasmic conclusion, but it winds up with this guy yelling at you in Greek for like 10 minutes or 15 minutes in the second, the third part, whatever it is, the last bit. And then the chorus winds up screaming and the music kind of stops. You know, music, the music dries up completely and it just becomes, you know, grunting and chanting and heaving. And that that is what is typical of Karl Orff. That is his career in a nutshell, because in his later works, you know, he did the Sophoclean tragedies, the Oedipus stories um, in Holderlein's translations in German, and then he did Prometheus in Greek, which has virtually no music in it whatsoever, just a lot of banging and shouting. And then he, you know, he did De Temporum Fine Comida, which is incomprehensible gibberish. And, and you know, and of course the, the charming Die Kluge and Der Monde and a bunch of other, you know, lovely little works, shorter works and things that were very nice. Die Der Monde is fabulous. That's sort of the next best thing to Carmina Burana. It's a German Bavarian jolly story about how the moon got where it is, a little fairy tale, and it's got a lot of similar music to Carmina Burana, but it too winds up doing as much talking as singing. And the talking is just irritating. It just gets you after a while. I'm sorry. I know when I talked about Prometheus recently, some of you suggested that I misunderstood Karl Orff's intention, you know, in setting a piece of music that was trying to recreate the 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 melos of of ancient Greek tragic performance of tragic play things and whatnot. And I get exactly what he's trying to do. I just don't care. It's just not musically interesting. It may be interesting from any one of a number of other perspectives, but musically, I don't really give a damn. And I have to say, the intent of this series is to tell the evil god Cancrazans that he should not destroy all of classical music by showing him the most characteristic or typical work of each composer. And if you want to be characteristic of Orphan, we have to be honest. We have to be honest. We have to show what he was about. And one work, Carmina Barana, I'm afraid, doesn't do it just because it's his most popular piece. It's not his most characteristic or typical piece. But when you put the three together, then you do get a sense of what he was trying to do. And whether the god Cancrazans cares or not, or wants to eliminate everything else Orff wrote, um, that's that's something um, we're not going to avoid by, by trying to uh, gild the lily because he's much too smart for that. He's going to say, yeah, Carmina Burana is fun, but what about all this other junk he wrote? Well, we're entitled to listen to it. We should be entitled to listen to it and draw our own conclusions. And Cancrazan should not be the one making the decision for us, but we have to be honest. And so the choice goes to Triumphi, all three parts, which if you're um, up for it, I mean, they're not terribly long, uh, you can give them a try and see what you think. You don't have to worry about the words. I mean, you know, they're all in Latin and Greek. And if you want to find translations, I'm sure you can. Um, but I long ago stopped worrying about what Orff was up to and decided I was just going to enjoy the stuff that I enjoyed and forget about the rest. And we have our options to do that. But in order to forget about the rest, we have to be able to listen to it. And that's the point this makes to Cancrazans. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.